Welcome to this new episode of The Context. Today I want to talk to you about what I would describe are the dimensions of knowledge. As we live in the world and acquire information and try to systematize and analyze and describe what we see, the knowledge that we acquire itself has a structure. And in the various ways that uh, we, in specialized professions of scientists looking at certain characteristics of the world, we then design what are mathematical structures or uh, theories and experiments in order to understand whether this knowledge is valid, these are in various ways characterized, for example, by their scale. Astronomers and cosmologists will talk about light years or parsecs, more appropriately, and they will talk about millions and billions of light years. Stars are hundreds of light years from each other or thousands of light years from each other. A galaxy will be a hundred or two hundred thousand light years across and galaxies will be millions of light years from each other and clusters of galaxies will cover hundreds of millions of light years as attracted by gravity they design the largest structures that we recognize in the universe. On the other end of the spatial scale, molecular biologists and chemists and particle physicists will talk about nanometers and femtometers, very, very small scales, where the processes, the phenomena that they describe are equally very rapid. Rather than light years, they will be talking about nanometers, picometers, femtometers, and they will be talking about billions of a second or, or picoseconds and, and femtoseconds. Also, as we learned in the laws of Newton, we can talk about statical knowledge, the description of the status of a system, or we can talk about a dynamic understanding. The first will be as if we had a map. The second will be the process that goes on the map and which sometimes transforms the map itself. And of course, they go hand in hand in terms of their precision. The more precisely we understand the starting points of the phenomena, the better we are going to be able to forecast its evolution. And this kind of uh, uh, granularity, which is fundamentally limited because of how the world is, and now we know thanks to quantum mechanics, the coverage, as well as the period of updating that coverage in the granularity of the description of the world, where this update is needed exactly because imprecise starting conditions are going to generate increasingly imprecise forecasts of the processes themselves, this influences the reliability of our knowledge and the reproducibility of the results of our experiments. And then, of course, another important dimension of the information becoming knowledge about the world is whether it is actionable. What are the applications that, uh, out of our science, 
engineers can design. A famous example uh, is uh, GPS, which wouldn't be possible and wouldn't be precise as we need it to be precise without introducing the necessary corrections due to um, relativity theory. The corrections of the clocks uh, due to their speed in orbit uh, of the satellites as well as uh, to the changes in uh, uh, the gravitational field are introduced in corrections of the system so that all the clocks are synchronized and uh, the signals traveling uh, between uh, the satellites and uh, our devices can be correctly used to calculate uh, their position. So the mathematics used in the scientific theories becoming engineering applications make data information knowledge actionable. And then as the systems that we design become widespread in our world, the adoption of those applications changes our own behavior. Uh, once again, before we had mobile phones, very simply meeting up with somebody uh, entailed different kinds of uh, behaviors and uh, rituals than not what we are accustomed of, uh, of doing now. And this leads to social transformation of how one can reliably live in a society knowing that uh, uh, what the person learns growing up can serve the purpose of, first of all, surviving, and then hopefully living with dignity uh, in relationships with others, building a family, and then teaching a set of behaviors that may or may not be the same as the one that uh, we grew up with to the next generation. So the dimensions of knowledge are pretty important as we address our challenges, as we look how certain decisions are made out of our unavoidable ignorance in front of a certain situation, and then those decisions can be refined and improved as the information and the actionable knowledge around the situation itself improved. Before starting recording, I looked it up and uh, turns out the fact that in the Middle Ages, uh, people would empty their night bowls on the streets is a myth. It's a persistent myth. We have this image of the filthy uh, streets in the Middle Ages and having to pay attention, otherwise you get showered uh, in the morning by somebody unthinkingly throwing uh, their nightly productions over you. The reason why uh, this myth is so persistent is because we have this genetic cultural memory of the powerlessness that ignorance created. Because um, the odor of excrements is biologically ingrained. So we are repelled by them as well as by the smell of rotten food or, or other things because our body literally knows they hurt, they cause harm. But what we didn't know is the mechanism through which they acted. What was really that we needed to pay attention to? Because, of course, in other circumstances, excrements have important uses. Uh, the fertilizer uh, of cow dung on uh, the fields must be something that uh, is correlated to our own excrement, but 
It is different because the first is beneficial, the second is harmful. If we uh, get in contact uh, with it in, in, in certain ways. So it took time until uh, we understood uh, the, the source of epidemics of cholera, the reasons why uh, they uh, would be born in a given area and how to contain the epidemic, how to understand the source and how to avoid it being um, reborn either there or in other places. And as we cannot stop thinking about it, we find ourselves in a similar analogous situation. Out of our ignorance in how the uh, virus causing COVID-19 uh, exactly spreads not the mechanism itself, because that we understand, but the uh, parameters of infectiousness, of fatality, uh, the mechanisms uh, by which it becomes a serious illness, a life-threatening uh, illness in certain people, while others uh, only have uh, very mild symptoms. This fundamental ignorance causes us to make decisions that block entire countries, subcontinents. As I'm recording this, three billion people are in lockdown under severe social distancing measures. And unsurprisingly, with a calculation that I have a hard time accepting, let alone acting on, there are those who say, wait a minute, these extreme measures have consequences. And if we look at those consequences, they can be even more harmful than the uh, illness that we want to prevent as fatal as it can be on certain segments. The economic trade-off of this calculation feels cold-hearted. And there are other consequences that are not taken into consideration. I read uh, of a scientific publication that calculates uh, that the improvement in environmental conditions, especially the drastic lowering of air pollution in China, will avoid the untimely death of something like 70,000 people, according to the calculations. Ten times as many will live longer than those who died because of the epidemic. And that evidently doesn't mean that we should want more of, of the epidemic either. What we should want is an improvement in our knowledge and understanding across many, many dimensions. We need to understand the mechanisms of action. We must improve our ability to test, both uh, reducing its cost as well as greatly increasing the speed with which we obtain the results. If in the United States, as I am recording this, you have to wait several days, up to five days to receive the results of a, of a coronavirus test, in Seoul, South Korea, there are telephone booth kind of stations where you step in, they test you, they take the, the cells for the testing, and a handful of minutes later, you have the results and, and you go on to do your business. Now, once we are able to test, then we can understand that locking down healthy people who 
haven't been in contact and are not going to be in contact with infected people is useless. And then we can release or lighten in certain areas the measures. Obviously, as we also allow travel, this kind of separation is going to be just temporary and any group of interconnected communities will be reinfected again. And then we must discover the infection much faster so that the infected people can be isolated and those who are not infected are free to live their lives. Which means that there has to be a constant, continuous testing. Now, we cannot test 7 billion people continuously yet, but we will establish what is the right amount, what is the right granularity, designing the map and of updating the map, and then making it actionable so that not an entire country or a continent has to be locked down, but maybe a city or a city block, or an apartment block. And as this continuous testing uh, improves as a process, it is very likely that we will start incorporating the ability to test in various devices that from being handled by professional uh, health uh, uh, laboratories only or healthcare professionals will be incorporated in nth uh, generation uh, smart watches, uh, which will be able to report um, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis, both to ourselves as well as to carefully chosen and vetted organizations uh, our state of health and our ability to uh, go about our lives without it being disrupted. And of course, we will extend this functionality so that the testing is not only a, a for uh, the virus um, causing COVID-19, but other viruses as well and bacteria. And from 1, we will go to 10. From 10, we will go to 100 or 1,000 different pathogens that in near real time, we will be able to keep track of both in and around our bodies as well as in our communities. And we will learn which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, and decide to immunize against the ones that we must uh, contain. And this process will evolve to the point where it will really rewire our perception of the world. We will look back 10 years from now to today with a feeling of astonishment or even horror. We will say, imagine you could enter an office building, a school, a shopping mall, just shedding hundreds of millions of viruses, infecting everyone, and nobody did anything about it. And, of course, this transformation of our mindset will uh, blind us to the fact that it's not that we didn't know. We felt we couldn't act on the knowledge. We didn't understand the dimensions and how to handle and manage them. We were not able to overcome the limits of the perception of the world as we would see it. And really, I believe that this pandemic is going to represent a watershed moment where we decide to reject this uh, ignorance, partially self-imposed, that with our level of technological development becomes unnecessary, intolerable. And that we will radically improve our understanding of the world at a granularity of microscopic life. 
we will design, deploy, and manage a new molecular Internet of Things that will constantly monitor and support our decision making in order how to co-evolve with the unstoppably evolving viruses and bacteria that we share the planet with. The sensors are going to be everywhere, not only in our smartwatches or our devices, they will be deployed so that they can keep monitoring uh, what is happening in the world. And this new environment is going to be, of course, something that we have to balance with our individual and societal perceptions of uh, privacy and data sharing. And that will be for sure the theme of one of the next episodes of The Context. If you follow me online, you will have seen that uh, on top of producing the weekly episodes of The Context, I also started live streaming. My motto is searching for the question. So I called the live stream searching for the question live and you can catch it daily uh, at 7 p.m. CT, 1 p.m. ET, 10 a.m. PT on many different channels simultaneously on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Twitch. It is also very interactive, as it should be. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions, to make observations. We are sharing the URLs uh, uh, simultaneously as uh, we mentioned them. Uh, yesterday's episode, uh, for example, was funny because uh, one of the viewers started restreaming uh, uh, within a virtual world uh, the uh, episode and uh, they sent me a screenshot that I showed uh, uh, during the episode itself. I have guests and if you want to be a guest or you want to suggest uh, uh, who I should invite uh, for a conversation, uh, feel free to do so. And as always, I appreciate your support on Patreon. If you have already decided to become a supporter uh, or I invite you to decide to do so, and uh, I am looking forward uh, to welcome you to the next episode in a week.